Bob, let's start with you. Well, I had very carefully positioned myself at the end of the row here so that I wouldn't be first. And so uh, <laughs> Dr. Henry once again has, has, uh, has thwarted my carefully laid plan. I was delaying standing right here, if you notice. I'll tell everybody else to go first. <laughs> Uh, thanks uh, to, to Dr. Hamry and CSIS for inviting me. This is a really important uh, issue, and uh, I'm, I'm happy to be part of the conversation today. Uh, I will make uh, a couple of quick points, uh, but let me just say, uh, Dr. Hamry mentioned this, uh, I am uh, an Air Force officer, and so the Air Force and its, uh, its relationship with space is part of the conversation here, but I want to remind you, uh, I'm not a pilot. Uh, and uh, five of the last six commanders of Air Force Space Command have not been pilots. The other one was, but he was a space shuttle pilot. And my view was anybody who has been a satellite is, is cleared to command people who fly them. So I think since the Space Commission, the Rumsfeld Space Commission in 2001, all of the commanders of Air Force Space Command have, have not been pilots, except for Kevin Chilton. And again, uh, anybody who's commanded the space shuttle on orbit uh, more than once, in my view, qualifies. So just so you know, um, an Air Force guy, but uh, I don't come from that background of, of uh, the, the aviation uh, piece of the Air Force. Uh, let me also say that, that I think it's a very good thing that this subject is being talked about publicly. And I'm very, very uh, reassured by the fact that the government is talking about these, the Department of Defense is talking about this, the executive branch, all the way up to and including the President of the United States, talking about the importance of space to our economy, to our scientific advancements, to our national security. And they have all been expressing their concern about why some steps have to be taken and why it is that we need to act. And I won't go back over that. I agree that the CSIS unclassified publication does a great job there. They also acknowledge that the pace of, of uh, technology is going faster than uh, our acquisition system has been able to assimilate. Uh, and they acknowledge, and I think this is right, time is not necessarily on our side here. I think that we assumed during the Cold War that our space assets would be threatened by the then Soviet Union. But the difference is that today, the loss of our space assets to a measurable degree could be decisive in our ability to prosecute a military campaign. I think that was not true during the Cold War because of the way we use space then and the way we use it today. It's infused in every single thing that we do and it's critically important to us and of course our adversaries have, have noted that. No one should be surprised. If you've been involved in national security space for any amount of time, you should not be surprised that we are where we are today. And the reason for that, I think, is, is uh, pretty clear. First of all, uh, we've been reluctant as, as a nation to talk about a war or a conflict that would either begin in or extend to space. We've been very reluctant to talk about that for all the good reasons that, that go with that, but we've been reluctant over time to talk about those things. Another reason is we've had a different set of priorities since 2001, since 9-11 of 2001. We've had a different set of priorities. And it's no secret, and the Department of Defense has been talking about this for quite some time, it's in the National Defense Strategy, it's in the National Security Strategy, that our ability to confront a near-peer adversary declined over that time. That was a decision about priorities, and it was also an assessment of risk. And so we are where we are, not because of malice of forethought, not because of neglect, but because I think we made some, some clear choices. We accepted some risk. The second major point that I would make is I, I think we need to come to some understanding about what's the problem we're trying to solve. Because we're off solving a problem here. Let's make sure we understand what that problem is. And a lot of panels have looked at what's wrong with space. I think the real issue in my uh, way of thinking is that this is first and foremost a war fighting readiness problem. We are not ready to fight a conflict that unfolds in a certain way against a near peer kind of a competitor. That's a readiness issue. And so I would ask myself, if we said we are not ready to fight a conflict that begins or extends to the air or the sea or the land, would we know what to do? And the answer is of course we would. And so take the word space out of the title, put the word air or, space, or, or uh, land or sea in there, and that's what we have to go do. This is a joint 
war fighting problem, and it's an organized, trained, and equipped problem that supports the joint forces. And I think that's important that we think about it that way. It's that today's problem is a war fighting readiness problem. If you buy that, then today's problem has to be solved today, not five or 10 or 15 or 20 years from now. Uh, the next thing I think we ought to think about is what does success look like? Uh, what do we need? in order to be ready for, for a conflict that begins in or extends to space. And first of all, I think we need policy that uh, both enhances deterrence and enables warfighting effectiveness. The second thing I think we need is, we need what I would call, had I still been sitting in the combatant command seat, we need the, the grunt work of joint warfighting. It's plans, it's tactics, techniques, and procedures, it's battle drill, it's exercises, it's joint training, it's all of those things that we do for conflict writ large. We have to make sure we have pulled space into that entire mixture of things. The next thing we need is an acquisition system that delivers affordable operational capabilities, not science projects. And it needs to deliver them in a technically and operationally relevant time frame. We need a resilient architecture and more effective capabilities to confront the problems that we're gonna to face today, which, by the way, threats against space objects may largely come from the ground. And so we need to be prepared, it's jamming threats. It's laser dazzling threats. It's those kind of things that we need to make sure that we can account for. And you account for that architecturally and also with some new capabilities. We need space operators that have the right amount of technical and tactical skills and experience, to include combat experience. I would just say that in my view, we have space operators today. We do not have combat space operators. And so what's the difference? You can go be an airline pilot, you can be a superb pilot, you can serve for 20 or 30 years, have thousands of flight hours and be wonderful at that, but you are not a combat pilot. We train combat pilots differently. And so we have space operators today. We need combat space operators. Some of them need to be combat space operators, which means that they need tactical skills as well as technical skills. And then uh, I would ask myself, so how do you get that? And I think this is two parts, once again. First, I think that you need the, the joint piece of this, and that's the purview of the combatant commanders. And so the first steps that the department has been proposing here in terms of reorganizing for warfighting effectiveness and all of those things, I think are good. They are linking these changes directly to capabilities and the issues that are described in the National Defense Strategy. They use lethality as the metric and they're looking to enhance both innovation and acquisition speed. I think they are addressing today's problems today. It's, a, it's improving joint warfighting. And I support those kinds of changes that they're making here. The commanders on the scene, I believe, have a voice in how we need to go about this. And so I'm supportive of what it is that the commanders say they need to go do. Um, but let's separate for a moment. You know, we, we say Space Force and that kind of wraps into a lot of things. Uh, I think I would not make that synonymous with a separate military department. I would think about a separate military department differently. And in that case, it's a matter of timing for me. Some people have said it's not if, but it's when. I've said that before, I've said that in testimony. It's not if, it's when. And so I'm a little concerned here that if the, if the when is right now, this may be premature. Because I think some things have to happen in order for us to be in the right position to make sure that that, that kind of a major step would be successful. So let me end there and just say again, thanks for inviting me and uh, I appreciate the opportunity to participate in the Bob. <coughs> Thank you, Bob. Sean, let's, uh, your thoughts here. Thank you. Um, I guess just to, to pick up a bit uh, from John's introductory comments in terms of what the, the bona fides and interest would be on the part of uh, NASA from a, a civil space standpoint, I think that one is fairly easily addressed in the context that was intended in the 1958 Act was to articulate a national policy aspiration that space would be preserved and removed from any prospect of a war atmosphere that would uh, develop over the course of time. 
If it ever existed, it certainly doesn't today. The technology doesn't discriminate over where it's used. So this is an aspirational goal. It's a very wistful policy statement in many respects, but it is virtually unenforceable. There is no prospect at all that you can eliminate the, the possibility of the use of technology for any conflict or belligerent purposes outside space, regardless of what the intent of any treaty implications could be, if there were one. There isn't right now. So as a consequence, all of this becomes a, um, uh, a, a, an artificiality between two institutions of government, the Defense Department, that clearly has the wherewithal, the means in order to, to access space, and NASA as a civil agency that has the capacity to develop capabilities to achieve different but certainly very comparable kind of goals from a, a technology standpoint. Um, the opportunities, I think, to collaborate between the two are still there. This has never been a case where, even since the 1958 Act, where the, there is no means to communicate between the two uh, elements of the government at all. No, there's plenty of inter interchange and activity uh, between defense and, and NASA in terms of the sharing of technology and uh, basic principles, engineering uh, opportunities and architectures. Uh, and so the, the, as well as lift capacity, as in launch capabilities that can be employed. Uh, and, and yet the, there's been a, 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 a real difference of what mission objectives have driven each of the respective institutions to, to solutions. Uh, and there could be, in turn, I think an opportunity uh, of any effort to integrate the broader elements of uh, the Defense Department military space access capacity into a more uh, focused unified capacity to plug into those capabilities from a place like NASA. And so in that respect, this is from a very purely administrative bureaucratic standpoint, a benefit of some you know, note that would not be dispositive as a, as a reason to do something like this. Uh, but it nonetheless does provide a clear kind of interface and opportunity rather than based on individual missions or whatever else. That said, uh, I, I've got to also focus on this from the standpoint as having served as a, a military department, uh, the Department of the Navy Secretary, uh, and associate entirely with Bob's assessment of this. I think, you know, this is a, an operational issue. And most importantly, to the extent that it is an issue, it is a solution desperately searching for a problem to apply itself. And in that respect, there's, this is just the absolute, there isn't clarity at all of what the nature of uh, the problem is, a definition of what the problem is that we're attempting to fix, much less any application of assessment of whether or not this is as proposed by either uh, the latest Defense Department's proposition coming forward, which again attempts to answer, you know, the, the nature of the public debate today. Um, if there is any application in those kind of cases, it is very much on its operational uh, elements of it. So, it, to the extent that you define the problem as elegantly, I think, as, as Bob did, I think there's a very clear uh, expression of, of direction of where uh, the opportunities could emerge and where there could be focus to be applied, it very much resides in a, 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 a partial endorsement of the Defense Department's uh, focus that was issued here just a few weeks ago of looking at a unified space command. That is an opportunity to emphasize the operational dimensions of pulling together the the aspects across the, the, the Defense Department in each of the military services that exist today and coordinate those, integrate them in a manner which you can, for the war fighting benefit, to the extent that technology, which is indiscriminate, is employed in those kinds of uh, uh, exo-atmospheric conditions in space, can you employ the full range of capabilities that the military has to, to come to bear on those uh, threat assessment kind of uh, driven propositions. And in that respect, that's a the Unified Space Command proposition 
has great virtue, and there is that, that's something that was probably verging its way towards uh, initiation as it was anyway, independent of the current debate involved. But from a, 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 an organizational effort beyond that, the idea of creating a separate military department is simply an invitation to start uh, uh, debating and arguing over what the size of that new overhead structure would be when the reality is none is required. Is the fundamental issues to the extent you define a problem that's in search of a solution. It is in the area as it pertains to recruit, train, and equip, as, as Bob elegantly described it, as a function of what a military department should do. That is currently charged to the Department of the Air Force. And in that respect, the assessment of what the problem is that needs to be addressed from that standpoint is first and foremost, at what priority uh, does the space-related assets within that department really address the nature of the national security policy and strategy as articulated at the highest level of government? And if the answer is it's wanting, as in deficient, then you change that priority to be among the top, if not the top priority that you seek to emphasize as part of the budget delivery, the, the expression from the, from the, again, from the President and the White House, the National Security Council in terms of the primary function of the Air Force should be as follows, restate it if necessary. That is a well-organized, you know, structure for the purpose of trying to, to attain this. So if, if the issue is there isn't sufficient priority place there, articulate it differently. Is that as a department there to serve the purposes of what's articulated at the national level as the, the national priorities overall? Um, and in that respect, the nature of the issues are, to the extent you define a problem, it is how you go about the process of delivering the assets necessary for a unified space command to actually operate efficiently. Uh, and that would be in the realm of acquisition and how organizationally it, this is structured. From the acquisition standpoint, um, again, the idea of severing this, creating a whole new organization, but one currently exists right now, uh, the opportunity here is to instead incorporate a few basic principles to the extent you've defined this as a problem. And that would be to really focus on the, the, the dimensions, capabilities of components rather than end product of what capability, how they are defined. And in that regard, this is a very, very well-worn path that the Defense Department, frankly, has blazed in a number of acquisition programs of looking at spiral development as an opportunity to incorporate different component capacity, insert different technologies to meet different objectives. That quintessentially is the nature of what space-related assets uh, incorporate overall. The second area would be to look at, at, at uh, the technology management of a potential technology or a rapid prototyping kind of, of uh, uh, capacity. That currently is not resident permissible within the context of how most military departments are organized. They don't have that unilateral capacity. There are some notable exceptions when directed by the Defense, Defense Department overall. But as, a, as an operating matter, that doesn't uh, happen as a regular sense. Trying to create that, I think, would be a fairly straightforward proposition. And the last part, in, from, in terms of the, the, the overall acquisition function, would be to streamline the decision-making process by simplifying top-level requirements, potentially creating, to the extent that Congress would ever agree, uh, a new account which would, a new account structure which would establish the means for the Department of the Air Force in this particular case uh, to integrate the assets of, of research and development, investment accounts, and operating accounts as necessary between and among those functions and funding opportunities in order to be as agile as they can be to meet those kind of rapid prototyping and spiral development uh, uh, opportunities that emerge. So this is a fairly straightforward set of, of bureaucratic answers of a solution to what you may define as a problem of a failure to establish the right priority, if that is in fact the, the nature of what the issue is. And it sure doesn't require establishing another 
stovepipe of excellence military department for the purpose of lording over all the elements of recruit, ra uh, train, and equip a force when the reality is that is amply handled today or organizationally could be by the proper direction of the Department of the Air Force to organize this on behalf of the Defense Department overall. So in that respect, I, I think uh, this is, first and foremost, the top said, a opportunity to really emphasize the operational dimensions. And then to, to the extent you see deficiencies to emphasize an opportunity to how to streamline this more appropriately within the existing structure. Sean, thank you. Thank you. Bob. John, thanks for setting this up. This is a very important subject. I mean, uh, both Bob and Sean have said, what is the problem? And the problem was stated by Congress. And it was, quote, space has not been able to get the attention it needs culturally yeah. or resource-wise. That was the problem statement. And they jumped directly to a solution, uh, create a separate space force to segregate the space professionals. So that's where we are kind of right now. I'd answer first, the first order answer would be, the United States has the most capable national security space constellation in the world. Bar none, period, stop. So if space had not been given the attention that it needed, we would not be in this envious position. Now we rely upon these forces for strategic intelligence, surveillance, and reconnaissance, indications and warnings of attack, and global battle management and command and control. And then, as Bob said, they now form the backbone of what we call operational battle networks that we assemble in distant theaters whenever we fight a conventional campaign. And it provides direct space-based combat support not only to U.S. Joint Forces, but to our allies. And these capabilities since the end of the Cold War have contributed in no small way to our advantage in conventional warfare. Now, no other competitor comes close at this point matching the full spectrum of U.S. space capabilities. And that explains why our two great power competitors have expended an extraordinary amount of resources and effort to threaten our national security space constellation using both kinetic and non-kinetic means. The Russians and the Chinese in particular are now pursuing space-based capabilities to improve their own theater-wide, what we refer to as anti-access area denial networks. The Russians refer to these big networks as reconnaissance strike complexes, and the Chinese refer to them as operational systems. Now, as a result, for quite some time, prior to 2007, but essentially since 2007, when the Chinese demonstrated a direct descent ASAT capability, the department has fully anticipated that a terrestrial war would, with either of these two great powers would quickly extend into space. In the vernacular of the department, we say that space is no longer considered an operational sanctuary, as John said, it is now viewed as a contested operational domain. Now the idea that the Department of Defense has been ignoring this development is laughable. We were well aware of the Chinese and Russian actions, and the department argued for more concrete responses. Now I can't speak authoritatively about, authoritatively about the Bush administration, but I can say that the Obama administration did not want to hasten further militarization of space. They believed, President Obama and the National Security Council believed if we openly talked about space war fighting, that we would essentially make that a reality. So they prescribed the department from even talking overtly about space war fighting. And they were very, very cautious about proving, uh, approving space control capabilities in the budget. Now, the department pushed back throughout the time, saying, look, the situation is changing. Uh, the threat against U.S. space assets is becoming more dire. And in June 2013, Ash Carter, who was then the Deputy Secretary of Defense, gave a presentation to the President and the full National Security Council. And the presentation was, here are the threats to our space constellation. And from that point on, 
although the department was still not authorized to speak in unclassified forum about space war fighting, we were given a green light to start to pursue in earnest space superiority. Uh, so let me say that we did this in a variety of ways and we were, follow we were animated by Bob's point that this was about a space war fighting problem. It was about space war fighting readiness. The first organizational construct of the third offset strategy was the joint interagency and combined space operations center. It was a space operations center that was set up jointly between Department of Defense and the intelligence community to fight the U.S. constellation while under attack. To do that, we had to create new battle management and command and control. And the way we described it in the department was that the JIC SPOC would look up and fight the constellation and the J-SPOC, the Joint Space Operations Center in Vandenberg, would still look down and provide space-based combat support to joint and allied forces. John Hyten, who was then U.S. Space, I mean, uh, Air Force Space Command, and Betty Sapp, who's the director of the NRO, agreed to a common space enterprise vision, something that we hadn't had in quite some time. And it became the architectural framework for the Constellation. We established a Space Doctrine and Tactics Forum under uh, then uh, Admiral Cecil Haney, who was STRATCOM. They would look at all of the tactics and doctrines. They'd feed it into the JIC SPOC. We would conduct experiment with, experiments with on-orbit assets. We strengthened the Space Defense Council inside the Department of Defense to provide better investment recommendations. That didn't work as well as we had hoped. We can talk about that in question and answers if you wish. And we pursued a variety of space control capabilities, both classified and unclassified. And in all of this, we received terrific support from the White House. From June 2013 on, everyone was all in. Now, some members of Congress did not think we were taking the threat serious enough and not acting more quickly and boldly. I can say with some confidence that given the post-BCA budgets and all of the competing requirements that we were faced, we were moving at the fastest speed possible given available resources. You can say, well, why wasn't space the number one? Well, at the time, when I became the Deputy Secretary of Defense in June 2014, I assessed that my two immediate predecessors, Bill Lynn and Ash Carter, really had gotten the cyber problem kind of on the right path. And I did not need to develop, uh, spend a lot of time because we had a cyber command and we were debating whether or not to make it a unified command. So I spent all, most of my time as deputy focused really on the space problem. And I note without any partisan rancor at all, the simple fact that the Obama administration never received, never once received as many resources as it, as it requested in the defense budget. So Congress could have easily said, hey, we're gonna give you a little bit more money and we want you to put it in space. But they didn't. Now, can we pursue these space capabilities faster and do better? Yes, and by all means, we should do so. Will creating a separate space force guarantee that we will? Not necessarily, I agree with Sean. There's still a lot of debate to go. But the President and Congress want to see more concrete action. That is clear. They have directed the department to do so, and the department has said, this is the first step. And in this regard, I think Deputy Secretary of Defense Shanahan, Patrick Shanahan, really threaded the needle quite not nicely. Uh, we should have never gotten rid of the Unified Space Command in the first place. We did it in a period where great power competition wasn't really considered a problem. We made a mistake. So getting back a Unified Space Command makes total sense. And getting that warfighter focus, as Bob said, on space. Now, having a space development agency, uh, this is one of these things where, okay, I'm willing to say, let's try that. Uh, I'm from, you know, I'm from the Missouri School of uh, Thought, uh, show me. Uh, but if it has a culture of innovation and really pushes out capabilities fast and does not become a tinker house for space, but really focuses on applications and capabilities on orbit to provide the warfighters, I think that's a really good idea. And having a space operations force is critical because it really is about culture here. 
Uh, we want to instill upon all those who control assets and space and support the joint and allied forces that spaces no longer can be considered a function. It is a war fighting mission. You must approach it from a war fighter perspective and you have to really, really get after it. You have to assume you're under attack, you have to be ready, you have to have battle drills, you have to have all sorts of things. And let me tell you, if anybody who's now gone out to the National Space Defense Center, which is the reinstantiation of the JIC Spock, man, it is just unbelievable how far we've come in a couple of years. Deputy Shanahan's uh, plan and all of the leadership in the department is really getting after space. And whether or not we get to a separate space force, I think is an open question. And it might ultimately be the right answer. But I want to assure everybody in the audience that the Department of Defense never ignored space. That is a crock of smelly stuff. Um, so we got to get better, absolutely. And I think we will. I turn to you, Tish, please. OK, John, thank you. Um, thanks for arranging this this morning. Thanks to you and, and CSIS. So being last in the lineup makes it a little bit easier. I associate with my colleagues' remarks. <laughs> um, Bob, your definition of the problem here, particularly that this is a war fighting readiness issue, I, I could not agree more with that. Sean, your enumeration of all of the opportunities that this presents the department with, I think is a good way of looking at this. And Bob, you did a terrific job of reviewing just how much the department has been focused on this, as well as the intelligence community and all of the actions that both DOD and the IC have uh, taken together. So the president has said that he wants to move forward with the Space Force and the department has laid out their plan. Let's assume um, that in fact we're going to move forward with this plan. I'm pretty basic, I look at this as form ever follows function. So lay out in fact, and let's start with the unified command. Let's have a clear understanding of the purpose of the command, of the mission, um, what are the issues that need to be focused on and fixed, what are the functions, what are the tasks that the command is going to undertake. Um, you outline those, then you get to the organizational construct and the people. So we're going to have a unified command. I'm assuming there will be an intelligence function. So intelligence support to that war fighting mission. Um, the way the department organizes commands is through the, the J staffs. Uh, there would be a J2, a directorate of intelligence. So what are the missions of that J2? Are they going to be the typical um, functions that any J2 in a unified command has? That starts with the operational missions. So that's a daily indicator status or space situational awareness. Uh, that's, or SSA, SSA for monitoring as well as rapid characterization of the threats. There's a protect and defend um, war fighting uh, mission. Indications and warning, attack assessment, attribution. So those are just the operational um, support type of functions that intelligence support too would cover. There's also security cooperation activities. There's joint war fighting planning. There's education training and exercises. There's the defense intelligence analysis plan, which talks about reporting responsibilities. In this case, one would assume that takes care of the on-orbit assets, but would that in fact include missiles in space? Right now those are covered by other operational commands. So these are the types of things that the department needs to walk through and think about from the standpoint of actually standing up a unified command, again from the intelligence perspective. There's the um, SCI comms that the intel staff usually uh, works towards. There's the integration with the other combatant commands, age, the other agencies, allies, our partners. Uh, will there be forward deployed space capabilities? 
that the J2 of this new unified command would have to um, have the capability to do, such as we have cyber mission forces now um, working out across the various combatant commands. Uh, would they advocate for capabilities uh, to this new space development agency? Um, and certainly across the other commands. There's counterintelligence functions, there's cyber functions. So I go through all of this to say it's complicated. You're gonna stand up a new command, you need to make sure you walk through all of the various pieces. Those functions, for the most part, that I just outlined don't exist today. They don't exist because we haven't had a unified command giving that demand signal. Yes, JFCC space as part of strategic command has given some of those demand signals, um, but as you have heard, we haven't had perhaps the focus um, that we could have had on space. So those capabilities don't exist today, that means we have to acquire them, we have to grow them, and that's not um, a trivial matter, and so the resources to do that um, need to be thought about. We don't have sufficient foundational intelligence today, let alone the support to operations. Again, this is a war fighting mission. So um, those are things that certainly need to be thought about. Bob Work talked about uh, the relationship that has been formed between the Department of Defense and the intelligence community, between STRATCOM, JFCC Space, and the National Reconnaissance Office. It's a strong relationship today with the National Space Defense Center. I would say we need to build upon that. Let's not break that strong relationship and the processes and procedures that have been put in place. So we need to be thinking about that as any new organization is stood up. So there are the Title 10 and the Title 50 equities that need to be taken into account as the department moves forward. I do believe having a, a unified command is a good thing. Again, it will give that demand signal to the intelligence community, a very direct demand signal that then the intelligence community can respond to. A space development agency, I guess I'm with Bob in the Missouri show me. Um, as Sean said, we have a very strong space and missile center today. Um, that is developing those capabilities for the department. Streamlining acquisition is something that we have been talking about for years. We haven't achieved it. So I think focusing on taking out all the um, extra steps, really focusing on how we acquire things as opposed to organizational constructs is something that could be uh, focused on more. Whether or not we ever get to the Space Force, a military department, I think remains to be seen. Again, I talked about growing um, intelligence personnel to support this function. There's only about 15,000 folks across the whole department today who are focused on space. I'm not sure that's enough to warrant a military department, but I guess we will see as we move forward. Yes, thank you. Um, just exactly what I was hoping for. Really wonderful uh, opening remarks. Uh, I come to this with the cold, dark heart of a comptroller, you know. Uh, <laughs> Sean was a comptroller, but he has a nobler interpretation of human nature than I do. Um, and I, my concern is that when you decide to create something really new and big, it brings out the darker impulses in people about their stature, their status, their relative pecking order in society. I mean, this sort of thing. You know, it took the Air Force, what, 30 years, 40 years to become an Air Force. And there were, God knows there was an enormous amount of arm wrestling. I'm concerned at a time when I, th I think our opponents are making great strides in uh, changing the dynamic of, of reliable access to space, that we're gonna spend a hell of a lot of time arm wrestling with each other in Washington. Now, each of you have got different perspectives on that. Bob, let me start with you just to ask, what, you, you, you arbitrated as Deputy Secretary over a lot of contending forces. What, what does this mean to create kind of a, uh, 
an open-ended competition for status and turf. I'm, I assume you're talking to Bob. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> no. I'll start with you, Bob. <laughs> well, this is what would happen. Uh, the department would try to count up all of the monies and resources being devoted to the space mission and capabilities as it could possibly do, be as accurate as it could. And if you created a separate space force, that would be their initial budget share of the department. Now you have to ask yourself, is that the right budget share? Um, you would have to then debate that. And so budget share between departments is very, very difficult to move. Uh, because of the reactions uh, that, it, uh, that it causes. And there are as many congressional proponents for spending more money in cyber as there are in space. Uh, there are, there's a very vibrant shipbuilding caucus that thinks we ought to be spending more money on ships. And so, as John said, you would get into a very, very interesting uh, intramural firefight on exactly how much resources would be devoted to the top line of the new service, which would have Title X authority to organize, train, and equip space forces. So, generally there are four things in the department that just cause a lot of problems. Nuclear forces, electronic warfare forces, cyber forces, and space forces. And the reason why they cause so much problem is all four of them go across all of the departments. It's kind of intermixed. The greatest expenditure on space is on terrestrial terminals. And guess who's responsible for buying the terminals? Each of the individual services to organize, train, and equip their own forces. So it's really trying to figure out how is the best way to adjudicate and figure out how much to spend on these four things. Again, nukes, space, cyber, and electronic warfare. And uh, the department, quite frankly, has been, you know, had trouble uh, and continues to have trouble uh, on this. And that's why you really have to be careful. Will creating a separate Title X space department solve that issue, or will it create other problems uh, that actually are worse? You know, I would just, <clears throat> I remember being in, uh, becoming the comptroller shortly after Sean, when he was comptroller, created DFAS. And it was absolutely the right thing to do, to create a unified finance and accounting system for the department. <clears throat> but what happens when you do that, and you pull it out of uh, the services, is the services, they, take their very best talent and they hold on to it and then they ship you know the weaker people to be candid the the lame the halt and the blind you know they get put over into a defense agency and you spend years trying to accommodate that i envision this would be a real challenge you get a, a fast burning high energy officer and he says do i want to be stay in the air force or do i want to go over to a new space force, Bob. What? How would? Uh, how would you see something like that unfolding? Those are clearly issues. I am struck by, by two words that got used. One by the vice chairman recently, and the other by the deputy secretary of defense recently. And one was complexity, and the other was cost. I am really concerned when people say we're just going to take everybody who is associated with space today, put a new patch on them, and that will do it. I think that's a minimalist approach that that sort of ignores the overhead that must come with a separate military department. And so I, am, I worry that if we are going to do a separate military department, then it must be set up for success. I think the issue about who will go into which part of it and all of those are always factors. When human beings are involved here, those are the complexities that, that we're going to have to address. I think, in my way of thinking anyway, I have that as an issue. It's this sort of this minimalist approach that I think would ignore the necessary overhead that must come with this that doesn't exist with a patch change today. 
where will the service academy be, for example? Uh, where, where do you get all of the personnel support? You know, if you remember, service staffs here in the Pentagon do two very, two, do two very important things. One thing they do is their classic organized, train, equip, policy kind of things. The other thing they do is prepare their service chief to be a functional member of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. And so who will do that? And somewhere along the way here, there needs to be a clear-eyed assessment of the resources that it will really take here to set up what is a, a service with not much mass, which is another concern that I have here, is addressing the mass issue. Uh, I'm concerned that um, we're not casting a broad enough net as we sit here today. I, I am very concerned that uh, f from the snippets that I see in public, uh, we're, you know, the various factions are trying to ground rule, as uh, Secretary Work said, they're trying to ground rule themselves out of the discussion. And so we have to cast a very broad net. One of the issues that has come up with space over the many, many years that we've debated these issues is the seams question. There are seams today. There's a seam between Title 10 and Title 50 space activities. How do we treat that? And I, I think saying, well, we're just not going to look at one side or not look at the other, or we're not going to look over here, or we're not going to look over there, I think is, is taking a minimalist approach that may not be the most successful way to proceed from the start. Let, I want to just share a personal experience and then ask you your reflection on this. Uh, I was out in California, I've been out, of course, in the San Francisco area, you down to, you know, Sunnyvale, seen the great big remarkable facilities that we have. We build uh, some extraordinary platforms, you know, historically, and they have had price tags to match the, you know, the grandeur of the, of the asset. Uh, we need to start pricing DOD satellites with scientific notation, I think. Um, at the same time, I went into San Francisco and visited one of these startup little satellite manufacturers. You know, I went into their clean room. You know, we, we did put on a smock, you know. It had uh, the, you know, the plastic that you have in the back of factories, you know, to keep flies out. That was what separated uh, the, the green room. They were making a satellite a day in there. I mean, they were, you know, guys were smoking cigarettes and jazzy music. And they were banging out a little satellite a day. I, I mention this to say we've got two remarkably different phenomena. The, the government space acquisition culture is high fidelity, very high cost. A, there's a new emerging commercial space environment that is uh, acceptable fidelity and very low cost. I mean, we're seeing two very different phenomena and some interest, some interest on the part of DOD to move the ship of state over to low cost. Uh, but I also know that when you define something new bureaucratically, you tend to want to do that by having lots of budget resources and big things to do. So you're, you're, each of you, especially Sean, your, your, your perspective, how do you see this? trend where the private sector is moving into space very dynamically, but at an entirely different cost environment and framework compared to the, the government sector. And is it possible to reconcile this, or are we just going to go like this? No, I, I, I think you put your finger on it, John. This is, the technology is moving so rapidly and so, uh, I think, effectively to permit this, this level of extraordinary speed. And again, this is just demonstration that Moore's law is real. I mean, everything, it is exponentially improving over time and happening in a, in a way that makes it extraordinary to see how fast you can see technology insertion into different end products to yield entirely different outcomes. And that's what the commercial industry is exploiting today without all the, the, the structure, rules, baggage that goes along with the kind of typical government structure in these, these cases, which is designed to maximize survivability, duration of operations, independent of cost, 
and low risk of, of, uh, of, of failure. And that is a real contrasting challenge today that I think almost inevitably puts us uh, into a position where we have to really focus on how to adjust that, which is part of this advocacy I mentioned earlier of let's go back to some basic principles of spiral development, looking at component uh, capabilities and insertion within end product that in turn enhance performance, how to focus on uh, the speed and agility of, of answer, and I think that certainly is embodied in the spirit of intent of what's articulated in the, the SDA part of the proposal, the acquisition phase of what the department here announced in the last month. Uh, but it doesn't need to be within a separately housed entity. So to come back to your earlier point, John, I think this gets wrapped up in the same synopsis you, for, you provided at the beginning, which is at a time when our adversaries are taking advantage of this very inexpensive, low cost, easy to access technology development of putting together a satellite a day as an example of that, uh, aren't we by this proposal simply instead spending all of our time fighting over the bureaucratic questions over which programs belong, which department, whose belt buckle ought to be adopted as the primary signatory uniform piece, all of fundamental irrelevant tribal issues that go into these situations as opposed to the greater challenge which technology is posing very imminently as this is a capability that's out there our aggressors our adversaries certainly don't see any distinctive line of demarcation there they're going to use whatever's available and easiest to access and wherever it needs to be whether it is in a agreed neutral domain or not, they will employ it for those purposes to our disadvantage, unless we are organized to respond to that promptly. And this is not the way to do, do that, as we argue about, you know, very traditional kind of, you know, again, a stovepipe of excellence related kind of, uh, you know, arguments between and among military departments. That doesn't answer it. Bob Taylor, I know you've looked a lot at the uh Private well, I, I think there are two things, and much, I think, to the credit of the department uh, and the intelligence community both, I think step one here, if you really want to embrace commercial, you have to make them a formal part of your architecture. You can't say, we're going to buy commercial when we need to or as an add-on. You have to say, there are concentric circles here. There's what the government has to do for itself, there's what we can do with coalition partners, and then there's what we can do with commercial providers. And so step one, I think, there's a recognition, at least as I read the, what the commanders and, and the senior leaders are saying, uh, I think they're, they're pretty clear that, that they have embraced commercial now as part of the architecture. The second thing you have to be able to do, uh, and this uh, certainly uh, when all of you were, were serving, uh, there was this desire to want to acquire things faster and, and all the things that go with that. Uh, I think you've got to recognize that there's a requirements-based acquisition process. That's how you get advanced DHF and SIBRs. And there's an opportunity-based acquisition process. That's how you get iPhones. And they are not the same thing. Mm -hmm. And so the government acquisition system does not do what it is that, that commercial interests do. There has to be a way to connect those dots between the two sides. And I think you can't make commercial do what government does, I think you've got to find opportunities to pull them into the architecture. This is a difference in acquisition, I think, in contracting and sort of the, the mechanics of how you make this happen rapidly, and then you just go out and get the stuff that, that you need and that you can leverage and that fits into your architecture and contributes to deterrence and resilience and yada yada, the, the list goes on and on. So I, I think there are two pieces to this architecture, and I, I'm very, very uh, glad to hear the way they're referring to commercials role in the architecture today and the second is where are those contact points that allow you to leverage that opportunity based thing that goes on in commercial worlds that, that make them competitive. Well, Ed, um, there's been a long vibrant debate on how you do space resiliency. How do you keep uh, 
your constellation providing support to terrestrial forces for as long as you can if the constellation is under attack. And some people said, well, the way to do it is just go small sats and just proliferate a thousand small, sat, uh, small sats and uh, no adversary would ever be able to shoot them down. Um, it turns out that just doesn't work analytically uh, when you're against a state opponent or a competitor like a China or Russia. Uh, because small satellites can be easily jammed and easily dazzled. They just don't have any space for any type of uh, protection capabilities on them. So in a real hot war, generally I believe a major state adversary would be able to make a denied, you know, a denied terrestrial footprint for these very small things. The fact of the matter is you need a minimum of a medium-sized bus that has fuel to maneuver. That is the key to resiliency. And you see that now being reflected in the space architecture and uh, different type things. But uh, as Bob said, we are going to use commercial space to augment the stuff that we would actually need to have if we, un, uh, you know, God forbid, ever got into a, a real war that extended into space. And you're going to have all sorts of stuff. Black Sky, which is a commercial company, is going to have half meter resolution on electro optic and uh, infrared. Hawkeye 360 is going to be the first commercial RF radio frequency collector in space. It used to be just a state uh, sponsored uh, activity. ISI uh, is going to have a synthetic aperture radar. You're going to have all these capabilities. All of those capabilities are going to help in peacetime for change detection, indications and warning, all sorts of pattern development. It's going to be great. And all this, the only problem for Tish and her friends is going to just be processing all this information. It's going to be enormous. Um, but in wartime, uh, many of those would just start to go away and you would have to be able to keep it. The other reason why you need to have uh, medium-sized birds uh, is because all of the combatant commanders demand certain resolution capabilities that only can be met with certain size apertures. Uh, so you can get a lot of help from the little small guys, uh, but you're going to need to have it. And uh, the department has been thinking hard about this, and I would expect the Space Enterprise Vision along with the uh, NRO uh, to reflect a healthy appreciation and a reliance on commercial satellites but for the roles that they are best suited for. Tiff? Very well said. Um, just to elaborate on that a little bit, in fact, the department and the intelligence community have already been doing this. Um, you know, Bob said incorporation of commercial into the architecture. Uh, two basic missions, if you will, for the National Geospatial Intelligence Agency, and that's um, imagery, what's going on around the world, and mapping. Today, 90% of the mapping foundational data is provided by commercial industry. That frees up the government satellites to focus on the exquisite, to focus on the high resolution that our combatant commanders demand, need, for planning and conduct of operations. So that has been happening today. Now it still gets into that requirements versus opportunity. And we have to figure out how to incorporate the opportunities, if you will. Again, this is something the intelligence community has been working for quite some time with an entity called InQtel. And InQtel works with the intelligence community and now also the Department of Defense uh, to take their requirements, focus those, to commercial industry, and then industry comes in and looks at, well, I think there's also a commercial need for that, so I'll go ahead and invest because it's dual use, if you will, dual use government and commercial. So we have some experience with that. We need to um, continue on that, and we need to get better at it. Bob, to your point on you know, all that data, this is again where commercial can help because now we're talking about artificial intelligence and machine learning. 
there's a big part, you know, we've been focused on space on all of this. There's the whole ground piece to it as well. And so there are lots of opportunities. Um, there is lots of partnering that is already happening. And I just think we need to continue to focus on that so that it continues to happen. It wouldn't hurt us to take a page out of how the commercial sector is getting operating costs out and maintaining our satellite systems. I mean, boy, they are elaborate, you know. And we um, so watching that would be a good thing too. Okay, let's open this up, uh, colleagues. We've got a lot of. Uh, Ma'am, we'll start with you. Let's we have a microphone down right in the second row. Yeah. Uh, thank you for your presentation. Uh, Katie Wang with NTD TV. Um, since uh, you discussed about uh, um, China and Russia, both are uh, competitors of the United States uh, in the space area, so uh, I'm wondering if Bob or some other, or other, other of you can uh, elaborate on uh, the challenge you have seen that China posed uh, to the United States in this space arena. Just to give some more uh, uh, details if you can and uh, um, do you think that uh, we have uh, enough capabilities right now to deal with this growing challenge? Yeah, thank you. Did everybody hear the question? Uh, Why don't you repeat it, Bob? Okay, uh, generally it is, can I elaborate a little and I know that uh, Bob can probably do it in Tish uh, on the challenges uh, provided uh, uh, faced by competitors such as Russia and China who know uh, just how important space is to us. I think the 2007 demonstration by China or a directive sent ASAT uh, was the clearest indication uh, that China and Russia who has uh, demonstrated these capabilities also uh, can pose a direct kinetic threat uh, to uh, assets on orbit. We have been dealing with all sorts of non-kinetic effects all the time. Uh, we are constantly being dazzled uh, when uh, imagers come over where uh, both Russia and China dazzle the sensor. Uh, we've worked through jamming. You probably read uh, North Korea would jam GPS satellite signals, uh, et cetera. So let me just say that at the unclassified level, there is a broad, broad array of ground-based, uh, non-kinetic effects that can be applied against space assets. Uh, there are ground-based kinetic effects like space uh, uh, direct ascent ASATs. Uh, China and Russia have both experimented with lasers. Um, and then increasingly Russia and China have had on-orbit capabilities that really concern us. Uh, you read about them in the uh, press where we're not sure what the satellite is doing, we're trying to characterize what it does. So um, the way I like to say this is think of the US space constellation like a convoy that's trying to get across the Atlantic in World War II. You've got to have close-in defenses against uh, you know, depth charges. You've got to have close-in defenses against uh, attacks. Uh, you've got to have long-range defenses, land-based, anti-submarine, uh, air that can go after these things over long distances. You have to have the 10th Fleet, which is operationally oriented. This would sit in the National Space Defense Center and the Unified Space Command and do all the operational analysis on the threats to the, uh, to the constellation and how you would respond to those threats. And that's happening right now. I mean, the National Space Defense Center is just really something when you go on the ops floor. Uh, so. Both China and Russia have a wide array of capabilities. We are really, really uh, thinking hard about how uh, not only can we uh, handle their capabilities, but how we can threaten their own uh, capabilities on orbit. So uh, as I said, uh, I'm a pretty much a glass half full, uh, even though uh, this is a hard race. Uh, I'm very, very confident in our ability uh, to maintain our space constellation uh, if we had to do so. I don't know if Bob agrees or not. I do. Uh, we have the most capable space forces on orbit today that we have ever had, and they are capable of dealing with a number of different threats. They were designed. Some of them were designed to deal with, with very specific threats. But 
We read what they write. We see what they have built. They show us what their capabilities are in exercises and demonstrations. And we understand that, that they are looking to hold our space assets at risk as part of a strategy for how to raise the costs and risks of US intervention and, and participation in global affairs. And so we cannot ignore that. And we're to the point where the sheer volume of what we have seen deployed by China, for example, and the capabilities we see uh, from Russia uh, are forcing us to do some things differently. Can I say something real quick? Please, please. Uh, all of our war games show that when you're in a, <coughs> if you really get into a confrontation with another great power, generally the first action will happen in operational domains that are extremely hard to attribute uh, actions. And that is cyber, space, and undersea. Those three areas. And where it plays off in space is if you have on-orbit uh, capabilities and you nestle up against one of our satellites, is that enough to trigger a self-defense response, which then in and itself might trigger a broader uh, confrontation in space. So space, we, we war game this all the time. We're trying to figure out the battle drills, the responses, when we would have to go to the National Command Authority uh, to take action. Uh, but because of the ambiguity of the threats to the space constellation, it is not as easy as it might seem. I would also point out that it's not just military assets. I know of commercial, commercial. a friend of mine, commercial company, they had a commercial satellite, repositioned it after it went through its transfer orbit, got to its uh, operating position, and a couple of days later, another satellite shows up right beside it. So they move. Well, that satellite moved with it. And this happened three times. I mean, so we're seeing this kind of phenomenon, not just on military platforms, but commercial platforms. So it seems to me at some point, we also need to start honestly talking about rules of navigation, just like we have terrestrially. We're going to have to start talking and calling out illicit behavior. I think this is going to have to be part of it. Uh, right down here in the front row, Microphone's coming to your right. Please identify yourself. Thank you very much. Um, Sandra Erwin with Space News. I wanted to ask uh, Secretary Bob Work, uh, a, a kind of a two-part question. When you look at the process of this space reorganization, it's a very unorthodox, uh, I guess to say the least. Um, so, uh, and the Air Force seems to be kind of sidelined from it. So. Do you see a potential risk uh, that the space mission could suffer because of this, this process being so confusing and uncertain? And the second part of the question, um, the vice president said there would be a, an assistant secretary of space at some point that DOD would have to nominate. Do you think that's going to be helpful to try to bring some cohesion to the, uh, to the process? Thank you. I thought I'd... I thought I'd dodge all these questions after I got out of government. Uh, but as far as the space reorg, I don't think it's so unorth re uh, unorthodox. It's just that uh, Congress and the President decided that this is a move that should be made. And the Department said, aye, aye, we're going to do it. It suddenly then, the debate ceased, and the Department said, we're going to execute what Congress and the President want. Now. Uh, some people might say, well, they didn't go far enough, but I think it's a very, very, as I said, I, ve I very much applaud uh, Deputy Secretary Shanahan because the steps that he took are not all that disruptive. I, as I understand it, the U.S., I mean, the Air Force Space Command will become the, is the shell for the Unified Space Command. So we already have the staff and everything, it's there. Uh, the Space and Missile uh, Center, what is it called, the uh, SMC, uh, you know, is going to become the basis for the Space Development Agency and pulling in all of the space operators like we do under the Special Operations Force. All of those steps are very, very good steps, but they're not as disruptive as going immediately to a Title X service with a secretary and its own staff, et cetera. 
So it's, you know, I don't think it's civilian control of the military. So uh, I don't consider anything where Congress and the president say, I want you to execute. I don't consider that unorthodox at all. I consider it, you know, a, a sign of healthy civilian control of the military. As far as the ASD for space, wow, this has been a debate. You know, how do we do this in the department ever since the Rumsfeld Commission? Should we have a uh, separate policy? Um, look, uh, uh, the one thing that I learned, and I, w I wonder if John felt the same way, uh, there's never been a thing that Congress doesn't feel can be solved by reorganizing. Uh, and so this is another reorganization. Uh, it could, could work out well. Um, but I'd have to see what the ASD would be responsible for before I could fully answer your question uh, and how, how the ASD would, would play. I would just add that uh, organization issues in the department, it's always about walls and gates and bridges. It's where do you build the wall and how do you avoid the negative impact of a wall by creating portals or gates that connect you. And this is always the engineering problem of organization in the department. Creating a, uh, a very rigid, and, and I tell you, when you get dollars allocated to services, those become very rigid boundaries in the department. <clears throat> this is going to require extraordinary effort to get suppleness back in programming. You know, this is hard to do. When you start locking dollars in with services, boy, I tell you, it, it's, uh, it's, it, it's, a, it's a formula for rigidity, not for flexibility. And I think that becomes the great question mark when we're moving uh, into something like this. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir, right here in the second line, we'll, uh, and by the way, I've got, a, I've got a former chief of staff of the Air Force sitting here, Doherty, and I've got a former secretary of the Air Force, Mike Donnelly, over here. Uh, if you guys, you've got a trump card, if you want to say something, hold it up. Uh, Steve Winter is an independent consultant. I guess this is also to Bob work. Uh, you mentioned the uh, cultures, and also you talked about culture of innovation. And clearly, the separate services now have their own cultures. And there's a lot of doctrine behind those focuses, you know, sea power doctrine, air power doctrine. If a separate space force is set up, uh, would you foresee, uh, along the lines of what Dr. Hamri was saying, that over time there would be a space power culture uh, that, the, that um, characterized those people? And ideally, uh, if it worked out really well, you would have something more like the SpaceX focus on space as opposed to the Unified Launch Alliance focus on space. Comments? Um, well, Bob, I know uh, as the former, you know, who was in charge of all of the space warriors, I know we'll have uh, a really important contribution here. But in, 20, uh, in 2014, uh, we went out, uh, we went out to the annual space conference in uh, Colorado Springs. And we said, look, this is a call to arms. Uh, we're no longer gonna consider space a function. We're gonna consider it a war fighting uh, domain. This is all about uh, thinking like a war fighter, acting like a war fighter. And believe me, the space community, I believe, reacted extraordinarily positively. And we're saying, let's go. And all of the stuff about the Air Force not supporting this, it's just crazy. I mean, uh, the Air Force was supportive. John Hyten at the time was the Air Force Space Command. You cannot find a better space warrior. Jay Raymond, I mean, there's no way we could have developed leaders like John Hyten and Jay Raymond and all of the other space warriors without having institutional support from the Air Force to groom them and promote them and put them into positions. So. Here's the thing, right now, this is, I believe when you go to a service, you were talking about offensive operations in their domain. Space power, how would you do offensive operations? 
And I don't believe the United States is saying we want to go to, we don't want to have on orbit space weapons that drop and provide space based fire support. You know, uh, I just don't think the United States is willing to go to that level. And that's why I think this is all about fighting the constellation while under attack and getting the operators in the mindset that they have to think every day about how they would respond to these attacks. But I would actually argue that when you go to a space force, it would be when and if the United States says, uh, we are going to conduct offensive operations uh, from space in support of terrestrial forces. And at that point, I think you might need uh, a separate space force to think about the implications of that and develop the doctrine, et cetera. Could, could I piggyback on that? So uh, I have heard people say, this is a moment like the creation of the Air Force. That's, that's the same kind of a moment. Um, I don't think that's true, and here's why. It's exactly what Secretary Work just said. Now you're going to hear an Air Force guy's opinion here, and I try not to be parochial, but I am what I am. So the Air Force separated from the United States Army because they reached a point where the concepts were incompatible. You had a concept for air power, speed, range, lethality, all those things that was proven in World War II to be fundamentally different than what the United States Army did and what it was going to be set up to do in the future. And so there was a foundational piece here, a conceptual foundational piece of use of the air and things in it for decisive war-winning strategic reasons. There is no such theory of space power today that's like that. Will there be one? Probably. Is there one now? No. Is that a foundational necessity for a separate force? I think you've got to address that issue. I think there's a foundational question here that needs to be addressed. Can it be addressed quickly, et cetera, et cetera? I, I don't know, but, but I think it needs to be addressed. I also think that you have to ask yourself, as you're addressing that question, whether or not space is so fundamentally different from air things that those have to be separated. Are they incompatible? And I got to tell you, again, this is an air person's perspective. I think those are complementary things. I think there's a vertical dimension issue here that's complementary. Speed, range, lethality, persistence, all of those things that we say are attributes of air, whether they're wielded by the Air Force or the Navy or the Army, all those things apply to space. Is it separate? I don't know. Will it be separate? A separate concept in the future? I don't think air and space power are synonymous, but I think they are very, very similar. So this is the mental work, I think, that needs to be gone through to have this conversation and, and to think hard about what that means for the most significant change to our national security structure since 1947 with the National Security Act that stood up the Air Force and Goldwater Nichols in the mid-1980s. This is a significant issue. The second point that I would make quickly is coming out of Desert Storm, an Air Force Lieutenant General who got a fourth star named Chuck Horner, who many of you have seen go on YouTube, watch his stuff from Desert Storm. I mean, he's a classic mm -hmm. warrior. He was put in command, dual had it, actually triple had it. He had NORAD, set that aside for a minute. United States Space Command at the time and Air Force Space Command. He walked in the door, I was around, he walked in the door and he said, we are going to spend our time figuring out how to make space relevant for the forward warfighters. And so the effort that was made by the United States Air Force beginning then was to make sure that there was never a time that a warrior said, where's that space stuff? And we took that on with a vengeance. The difference today, and, and by the way, by the time I got to strategic command with Iraq and Afghanistan going on, no combatant commander ever looked at me and said, we're not getting what we need from space. The difference though now is those same space people have got to be able to fight their platforms in order to do that. 
That's not something they had to be considering before. And that's the cultural difference. There is a cultural difference in that regard. That gets to what I was calling earlier combat space operators, as opposed to just people who fly satellites. There's a difference. And they need to be tactically trained as well as technically trained. Sean? Yeah, just, I'd say one exclamation point to put on Bob, your, your, your commentary, which I think is a demonstration that you don't have any parochialism in this argument, regardless of how much you attempted to, to qualify this as coming from an Air Force guy. You really nailed it in, in the sense that the, the primary definition of how culture is defined to the essence of the question is in the manner that he uh, uh, organized or, or, or discussed that you have to have a concept of operations and strategy on how you'd employ assets differently or uniquely in order to counter what you believe or perceive to be an advantage, a threat, whatever else. None of that exists in this situation. Uh, I think the only thing that's unifying in the debate today is an acknowledgement that there are other capabilities outside the United States that are developing rapidly that could be employed for the purpose of demonstrating disruption, something else, or actual uh, elimination on the part of, of, of others of assets that are operated by the United States. That's it. That's the only thing that's unifying in terms of the threat definition, if you will, very broadly defined, instead of a concept of operations, which I think Bob is describing, that is absent. That's, that's an essential element of power projection from the sea, capability of land forces, all the other things that have, I think have been, as a matter of historical analogy, there isn't anything comparable in this kind of circumstance. Yet, it may yet evolve. There's no question about that. Absent that, the culture will be defined as behavioral. And the behavioral culture will be, it, like any other organizational organism, it will be very tribal. It will be organized based on who's got what, and we'll spend all the time talking about uh, issues like what is the budget share, as Bob alluded to earlier, Bob Work did, in terms of how these kind of things would be organized going forward. And I don't think there's ever been a conflict in the history of warfare that was defined and decided by whose share was the greatest. It really doesn't turn on that. But it is the part that occupies most of the wars here inside this logic-free zone we know as Washington, D.C., which is a debate over those shares. Who gives a damn in the final analysis is never a question that's asked outside of here. Well, good John, I just wanted to point out, Please. you had mentioned uh, Secretary Donnelly. You can't see him because the lights are on, but former Secretary Peters is sitting here as well. Fine. The lights are uh, on, yeah. but I, uh, just but, so you know. Uh, we're, just, we're really at the end of time. Uh, I do want to just, if I could, just em embroider one comment on what you just said, Sean. <clears throat> the budget shares, if you were to correlate a services share against the top line movement, I've never done it, but I bet it's an R square of nine five. You know, you just, uh, you know, it, they just move together. Yes, exactly. So if you really want, if, if the question is, is What's the problem? Well, we're not spending enough money on defend uh, space. I promise you, creating a separate department is going to lock in today's levels. That's right. Mm -hmm. yes. It will never get better, yes. just because that's the way it works at that at that time. Bob, yeah. and uh, you know, a lot of people say, "Hey, let's do the Department of the Navy thing, where the Marines and the Navy." But there's a little thing called BISOG, blue in support of green. It is a budgetary slice of the Department of the Navy's budget that is dedicated to the Marines. You go and ask the Marines, do we get enough amphibious ships? And they'll say, no, we get screwed every year. <laughs> they say, did you get enough uh, you know, in Marine aviation? Absolutely not, the Navy screwed us again. And so put it, that's why, like Bob and Sean said, you have to really decide how you're going to do this because any type of choice you make yeah. is going to create second and third order effects uh, that may be worse 
uh, than what you have right now. Yep. Sounds, uh, sounds like a Marine that became Under Secretary of the Navy. Uh, <laughs> yeah. He's got battle scars. <laughs> Thank you. I, I'm sorry we're at the time. I promise Sean's going to have to catch a flight. Would you please say thank you to them with your applause? This was a very good summer. Thank you. That was, that was a terrific summer.